self matters because black lives matter. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Black health matters. Black health matters. Black health matters, black health matters. Black health matters because, because black lives matter. Because black lives matter. Black health matters because black lives matter. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of inequality, Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. All right, y'all. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another incredible Wednesday evening. Um, we're all blessed to be here. So if you're sitting at home watching, be happy. Don't complain too much because somebody didn't make it. As the wine is once saying one time, millions didn't make it, but I was one of the ones who did. So we're here, and we're here to talk about black health. It's something that we very rarely talk about, but um, Justin Yard and myself have committed to make this a normal conversation in our households. Tonight, we have a special guest, a very special guest. My man, brother, doctor. I got it right when it was at AIC, Dr. Akinyale. Yeah, we'll go with it. Lovelace. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Dr. Lovelace. Here we go. Yeah, I got the last name. Yeah, Akinyale. You know what, though? Okay. That, was, that was a good one, bro. Listen, I've, I've been called plenty of worse. Uh, <laughs> I could go through my greatest hits, but I don't know how long we've got. So uh, I appreciate you being here tonight. Oh, man, we're happy you're here. So we want to talk about black health. Yeah. This pandemic is happening. Um, the numbers are picking up again across the country. It's not a Springfield thing. It's not a Western Mass thing. Numbers are picking up across the country. And um, people are worried about it. And I believe rightfully so. I think we should always err on the side of caution. So tonight, we're trying to learn as much as we can. I think Justin's more familiar with it than I am. But um, if you can, can you talk about this particular crisis? And let's talk about how people can prepare. Then as we get going, I don't have a regimented agenda because I like to see where the conversation goes. And we'll just take it from there. Is that cool with you? Yeah, that works for me 100%. All right, um, so why don't we start with you giving an introduction on who you are? Let's my bring name's Dr. Akinelli Lovelace. Um, I, uh, wow, went to Xavier University of Louisiana for undergrad. I went to Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, I did my training at Newark Beth, Newark, uh, Newark Beth Israel Medical Center in Newark, New Jersey. Um, subsequently thereafter, um, I did a lot of work out in West Texas, um, Amarillo, Hereford. Um, did some teaching while I was there at the University of North Texas. Decided to relocate, come back to Western Massachusetts. Um, I got a lot of family out in New York, New Jersey. Um, so being back on the East Coast means a lot to me. Um, since I've been here, I've been a part of a private practice where we've kind of, we're kind of, we flourished uh, here on the uh, Western side of the river. Um, outside of that, um, uh, I'm active uh, with the Board of Trustees at Bay State Health. Um, and so, for me, being a part of healthcare within Western Mass means everything to me. Um, and making sure that I can take care of my people matters even more. Right. Um, as someone who has lost family members to this virus, uh, I lost three. Um, I've adopted a child into my home from this virus. So it means something to me. My staff, I had 42 staff member in my office um, prior to all of this. I'm down to 24. Oh, wow. A couple of my practitioners got sick and got hospitalized. Oh, man. Well, my staff got so sick, they were in the ICU for up to three weeks, and they still haven't recovered, and they're still not back. And I wouldn't dare ask them to come back, would you? I've had, I've had an office of families, um, young and old, Latino, Black, white, all of them get it. And for me, this is a pandemic that hit so close to home I can't even express the type of energy that I have when it comes to making sure everybody's aware of what's going on. Right. I can tell you so far from this perspective. Okay. When I started seeing patients back in April, I got a phone call like, hey, Dr. Lovelace, there are some patients, a part of your practice in your town that have this, this virus. And we knew it was very contagious at that time. But the response that we got was, well, it's not that bad. It's gonna be like the flu. I'll be okay. April, May, Bay State looked different instantly as if it was overnight. 
People started wearing masks. People started getting scared. Next thing I know, I'm in Bay State. I'm in the ICUs. I'm in the COVID units. I'm I'm the part-time guy. Wow. But I'm there, right? I'm there. Yeah. And who else is yeah. there? My people are there. Like my people are there that are greeting people at the door, taking care of the taking care of the floors, taking care of visitors, um, making sure the phones are working. Um Everyone is there, and we're not really too in tune to the fact that it's that contagious. By May and June, it gets really bad, where all of a sudden the rates of people that are getting sick and getting admitted to the ICU go up exponentially. I can fast forward to now, though, and I can tell you one thing, and we'll, we'll, we'll break it up as things go along. What we're seeing now is we are seeing the cases start to go up. But what's good and what's come out of this is that we know what we're anticipating now well before it hits the fan. Right. Back in April, when I got into this, I had no, there was no leadership. There was no direction from the top that really gave us some input as to how we were so, how we to approach this. Classic example, man comes into my office and says, hey man, yo, the guy on the NBA got a COVID test. How come I can't get a COVID test? My response was, are you worth a million dollars to anybody? So right. it comes down to that. And so all of a sudden, I'm going through a panel list where it's saying, if you if you didn't travel from China, if you didn't travel from Italy, if you weren't coming from South Korea, you don't get a COVID test and you don't need a COVID test. And I was saying that to people in their faces in April and right up into May, but primarily March and April. And so right. the pandemic all of a sudden just blew up because we know that it colonizes in your nose. This virus exists in the nose. And the thing about this virus that makes it very unique is that once you get it, you don't you don't show symptoms. Like you don't show symptoms for quite some time, sometimes up to five days. And all the while this virus is just building up into your upper respiratory tract system. And so by the time you realize that you might be feeling some kind of way, you're like, ah, mm -hmm. that's just the flu, I'll be okay. Next wow. thing you know, seven days, 10 days later, you're like, man, doc, I can't breathe. I think I need an antibiotic. So you call your doctor like, hey, doc, I need an antibiotic. I feel like I'm coming down with the flu again. I need a z pack And I'm like, okay, here you go. Next thing you know, four more days after that, they're not getting any better. They're wow. actually telling me they can't breathe. And at that point, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Now you need to go to the hospital. But you see the problem, when I did that in April and May, it was already too late. And so people were coming to the hospital already sick because it had been hibernating in their body for so long. Fast forward to now. For now, a lot of people, as soon as they sneeze or cough, or you see somebody cough in the store, you're like, oh, I need to get a COVID test. Or you're, you're hearing about people in your job, or you're hearing people at wherever you may be, where you do your work of business, they might have been exposed. So you're more quick to pay attention and get it checked out. And so we now can identify these asymptomatic carriers, who a lot of times are the reason why some people get it and other people don't. And so now, when we look at the numbers at Bay State, I'm happy to see that of the 34 people across the entire Bay State Health System, all of them were hospitalized, but none of them were in the ICU. It right. was much worse back in April where everybody was ending up in the ICU because we were not in tune to how fast or how contagious this thing is and then how deadly it can be for a lot of people for a variety of different reasons. Wow, that came on like, Justin, anything? I think one of the first things that I, that it stood out to me is the understanding of the virus and uh, not only our community, but the U.S. responding in a timely fashion and how that kind of curtailed the death tolls as well as the people getting infected. Um, another thing I wanted to ask was, are you seeing a increase or disparity between African-Americans and our counterparts or any other ethnicity when it comes to people getting infected with COVID or also, um, also dying as a result of COVID? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, we're two times greater than would be expected in our share of the population. In four states, the rate is almost three to four times greater of contracting this disease and dying from this disease. Don't you know, I, I was just looking at these numbers. If I get this right, in Wisconsin, at least 141 African-Americans died. 27% of all deaths in that state, 27% of, of, of all deaths in that state 
where just six percent of the state's population is black. That's unreal. So so we're seeing a very large, large, large population of African Americans. We could even take out the notion, like you could even say, oh well, let's just let's let's look at the very wealthy African American counties or the the more affluent, predominantly you know, well-to-do African-American communities, even if you break down for that, you're starting to find that in these counties where there is predominantly African-American, they account for 56% of all COVID deaths. 56%. That's, that's unheard of. It's unreal. And so now everyone's starting to come and have to take a look and see what's actually going on. Like, well, why, why is this the case? And what we know it's, it's, it's not genetic, right? There's no, it just doesn't exist because how is it that I got a fa- I got family in Virginia, they're doing just fine. I sent them masks, they good. I got family in New Jersey and Brooklyn, and they died. So 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 we're seeing it, and we're starting to identify it. And the facts and everything is clearly being demonstrated. And I hope we continue to ask, um, you know, our our legislatures to continue to ask to look for these demographics and look for this data because this data is real. And they, I'm not saying they're trying to hide it. But I think it's extremely important that we account for racial disparities that exist within our culture or within our society. OK, so let me back up a little bit. What exactly is this disease? I mean, I hear a lot of people. If you can just break it down, layman's terms. I, um, while I was with the city, we had um, Dr. Kerouac come in from oh, yeah. State. Yeah. Good guy. And uh, they break it down. But sometimes it went over my head. I'm not going to lie. So for those who are questioning you know, the disease is obvious, it's real because people have been negatively impacted by it. What exactly, can you explain what exactly is this disease and what are we dealing with? Um, How serious is it and how, you know, if you find yourself infected, what's, what should you do in terms of what, what does treatment look like? Okay. So, so what is this disease? This disease is a upper respiratory virus. So basically you got to think of the flu. Um, Basically you're going to have a cough, you're going to have a fever. You might have chills. Um, that's where it kind of starts. This is a contagious thing that when you cough or sneeze or sing or laugh or yell, it travels through the spit in your mouth. It travels through the, the passages in your nose. It then gets to the other person and it pretty much either gets into their face or some form of, of, of where they can access it. So it can get into your eyes because your eyes can absorb things very well. It can get into your nose and get into your mouth if your mouth is open. This virus then starts to replicate or it starts to um, reproduce all in your sinus passages and all in your lungs. At that point, what it starts to do thereafter is travel into your lungs and for some people it can cause a pneumonia. Okay. But let's back up a bit. Doc, how do I know the difference sometimes in what I'm seeing uh, between someone who may just have the flu or someone that might have COVID? Well, for me, it's the fever. The fever has been spectacularly high. So I get somebody that calls me that are in their 40s and 50s, and they're telling me they have a fever of 102. Man, you shouldn't have had a fever of 102 since you were in grade school. Right. But if a man calls you and says, hey, doc, I got a temp of 102, I'm going to say, hey, man, it's time to get checked out. And you may want to start quarantining yourself ASAP. And the reason is because while you have that fever, you're giving this virus off. It is actively replicating at a very high rate. The problem with this virus is that a lot of times when most people get sick from a virus, they usually, it usually occurs within you know, 24 hours, you know, 42 hours. This virus can affect you and you may not show any symptoms, sometimes for up to five days. And so those are the issues that we're dealing with with this. It gets severe because it starts to really affect your lungs. And then you develop a pneumonia, and that's the problem. A pneumonia is an infection in your lungs. And when you get this infection in your lungs, it makes it very hard to breathe. And what happens after that, we can actually even see it on the chest x-ray. It's spectacular to a certain extent, the rate at which your lungs were clear, like like these two big, clear black areas. And next thing you know, they're all filling in with all these dots. And next thing we know, we're like, man, this guy's lungs look horrible, and it can happen instantly. And that's because this virus is creating an infection within your lungs that makes it hard for you to breathe. And that's the first problem that we started to see. After that, it can get even worse. What we started to notice after that is that your body also starts to make clots and you start making blood clots. 
And these clots can develop in a variety of different places. And that's become the other issue that we're starting to see. And when you start clotting throughout your body, that means you're not getting blood flow to certain parts of your organs, would be your brain, um, your kidneys, your lungs, just in your legs. And so we're seeing that also um, for a lot of patients who've, who've had this and have gotten really sick and stricken with it. Treatment. There are some treatments out there now. Um, here in our area and in our region, uh, the protocols that, that Bay State follows, are, they're, they're very strict about the medications that they're choosing to use. Depending upon how severe your symptoms are will depend upon the kind of treatment that you're going to get initially. If you just show up to the hospital short of breath with a fever and your oxygen levels are good, you're gonna be okay for the most part. They just need to watch you and watch your fever and make sure that you don't become you know, a risk to the community. For some, they actually require oxygen and typically we put them on oxygen. And the reason is because by the time you've gotten to the hospital, if you're to the point where you've developed a pneumonia, you more than likely require oxygen. And that oxygen is important because that's going to give your tissues all of the, the support that they need because you're about to go through a very, very tough period of time in relationship to an illness. And we, we pray that you don't have any other type of chronic diseases or chronic illnesses that could make your recovery to this worse. But during this process, we usually give them oxygen. If we find that they still require high amounts of oxygen, they start to get steroids. And steroids has been the next step that we've utilized in helping to decrease the amount of inflammation that's occurring within these lungs. The problem is, is that with the infection, this virus is replicating, but also causing inflammation and making it hard for the person to pretty much breathe. And when you can't breathe, you can't oxygenate your tissues. And when you can't oxygenate your tissues, they start to shut down. And that's the issue. We now get to a point now where we have more IV medications that are antiviral. So um, Redesivir is what they're using now, which is a great choice, but you have to act and you have to use it rather quickly. That's shown to be effective. However, you have to use it within 72 hours of the diagnosis. And so that's the other primary issue. Going forward, the other issue is what they're starting to do with giving antibodies from other people and starting to create almost like as if you were exposed to it, but you weren't so sick, I could help you by giving you some of the memory of my immune system to you. And that's what can happen. And so that's what we're seeing also with, with what they're doing with kind of what's called a, a, almost like a, you're giving you the antibody medication for other people who've been exposed to it before. And so those are the primary treatment options that we're seeing so far. Um, and it's showing great promise. Okay. Let me ask you, um, what are some of the tips you would give a patient to prevent the spread of this um, coronavirus? That's the hard part. Okay. Right? And that's the problem that we've been dealing with. So the problem that we've been dealing with is the notion that um, we are encouraging people to be socially distant. We are encouraging people to wear masks. But that can become a problem if you live in a neighborhood or a town or a home in which there are multiple people living within your home. How can you, how can you appropriately social distance in that scenario? The other thing that we ask people to do is stay at home if you, if you can do so and your job will allow you. Well, unfortunately, a lot of our people are those essential workers in a lot of different facets of our community and of our life. And so they can't stay at home and self quarantine. And that becomes the issue. And so if I had to make some recommendations, it would be these. Number one, wash your hands at all times. If you're out there, number two, when you come home, if you're out there working in those streets, you definitely want to make sure that you take all your clothes, put them somewhere, put them in the wash, and then get upstairs and shower. Outside of that, you want to make sure that you are have all the hand sanitizer you could, you could possibly get your hands on. Um, and most importantly, take the time to making sure that when you do get home, that you have proper ventilation in your house. Open those windows. I know it might be cold outside or it might be, but you wanna make sure that you're getting plenty, 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 plenty of air moving throughout that house. Because what we do know about this virus is that it, drive, it travels in droplets. And so right. those are the things that we want people to kind of keep in mind when they get the opportunity to do so. All right, now there are a lot of myths 
social network is what it is. What are some of the myths that, um, oh, before I even go to that, Victoria Sweeney, hey, Victoria, asked the question, why didn't they use antivirals first instead of Z-Pak and hydro? Hydroxychloroquine, great question. Uh, there we go. We didn't have one that worked for it. Like, that's the honest answer, right? Like, all the other antivirals that we had, it was more of a shot in the dark. Um, the most common one that we would use, Tamiflu, is what some people use for influenza A and B. There was no guarantee that it would work whatsoever. So why take the risk of giving you something that it's not going to work? Or I, would, I could just give you anything, right? Like, I could just give you whatever and then see what happens. And then you run into a problem where you're just, you're just treating people for something that you don't really know really works well. And you're going to put them at risk for that. It's a great question, though, because we definitely all thought about it. Like, that was definitely the thought I had going into this. And yes, I definitely tried and started to give azithromycin as fast as I could. We thought that would pretty much help the situation. But the, but the primary reason was just we didn't have that antiviral out yet, and it wasn't approved yet for us to use in the hospital. Wow. Okay. Justin, before I dominate the conversation with a million questions, I have a million questions in my head. Anything? Um, not really, but I know, um, I was pronounced wrong. hydro, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, um, yeah. which is anti-malaria, right? You know, they use it for that. Um, and in certain states and certain districts, they're gung-ho about it. And in some other places, they're not. Um, and do you see the disparity nationwide? Because as people may not know, when a disease in a, um, or a virus comes up like this, there's a lot of research and past research that's been done. Um, given that it's, it's, a, it's a SARS virus as well, it's, there, was some, there was definitely some uh, research done on it. Did you ever get the chance and opportunity to see the validity of those other research studies that, or, or, or treatments that were done in other states and stuff like that, that were used in, pronounce it for me again, I'm terrible. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we were using it. I mean, we definitely were considering it. I, I mean, I was I was I was on that COVID floor April, uh, May, June. We we definitely had it. Like we were thinking about it. Like we were asking each other. We were looking at the studies um on the other side of the state. Uh we were looking at the studies from New York, right? Because a lot of it was coming out of New York. Mm. I mean, honestly, we were looking at stuff coming out of China. Um, we were looking at every option going forward in regards to what the response was and how effective it was. And the other question was, is when do you use it? Like, at what point does it become something that is a value? And how do you how do you quantify its worth? Like, how do you quantify that it's actually making a difference? And it's not just the person just getting better on their own. Right. Um, and so, you know, our biggest response sometimes is want to we want to prevent medical inertia. Right. Like, you just don't want to just do nothing like you want to do something. Um, and I think hydroxychloroquine was a great idea. It made sense to us. A lot of us, it made sense. But we then had to follow the data and, and realize it, it really wasn't helping people. Like it, was, it wasn't making that big of a difference in the area that we were treating them. Um, and so we didn't find it to be a value going forward and look for other therapeutic options. But I mean, when you got somebody who, you know, you get that 50-year-old that, that's coming in, that 40-some-year-old that person that's coming in, and they're they've got the tube down your throat. They've got they they've on life support. Um, you're thinking of all possible causes here, and all possible treatments. And so we definitely considered it. Wow. Okay. Now let me ask the question: Myths. What are some of the myths that um, the medical professionals have to contend with in terms of people coming in, getting checked out, getting the test, or just really taking this virus serious? I think the biggest myth that I'm dealing with right now is that masks don't work. Uh, masks do work. Uh, you need to wear your mask. Um, when I go to work and work in the hospital and deal with patients who have COVID, I wear a mask. I sometimes wear two. Matter of fact, no, I wear two masks, right? Um, you need to wear a mask, right? Like that's just, that's just what it is. Um, we know it's effective. There's a lot of data that indicates that. And that's the one thing, if I could say anything that I'd want to get rid of right now from the jump, is that. I'd also want to mention that uh, being young doesn't put you at risk. That's not the case, right? Like, although we're seeing, you know, obviously the data indicates, right, the older adults, uh, those who have chronic conditions tend to not do as well. 
but that does not exclude the 20 something year olds or the 30 something year olds from catching this virus and getting sick from it. So I think for me, mask wearing and, and, and the young, not really taking it as seriously as I'd like. And I, I don't know where more I fit in calling people young or old these days, but I feel like if you're in your twenties and thirties, even in your teens, you know, um, what we're starting to find is that although they may not get sick, they still give it to their older parents or their loved ones. And so they too have to take this as seriously as everybody else. Okay. And then I'm um, the World Health Organization. They have a number of other myths that are listed. Myth number one, hand dryers can kill the new coronavirus. Nope. According to the World Health, or well, World Health Organization, I got to learn how to read. Hand dryers are not effective in killing the new coronavirus. Instead, the best way to protect yourself against COVID-19 is to wash your hands, as you said, as frequently as you can. Myth number two, an ultraviolet disinfection lab can kill the new virus. Um, so it's true that some hospitals use UV light to kill microbes on surfaces, like in operating rooms or labs. But per the um, World, Health or World Health Organization, UV lamps should never be used to sterilize hands or skin. Number three, thermal scanners are effective in detecting people infected with the new coronavirus. Um, if you walk into City Hall, they have the new thermometers that just takes your temperature. But that does that cannot determine whether or not somebody has the COVID virus, correct? Correct, sir. Because uh, people are like, nah, I go to work every day. They put the right there on my forehead and I'm, you know, I'm good. And it's just like no, you're good because you don't have the, you don't have a fever, right? Like you don't have right. a fever, and I think I think that's where the value of this comes from. But no, if you, to get that Corona test, you they got to stick something up your nose, bro. I'm sorry, that's the only way. I mean, there's there's a spit version too that's coming out in an oral swab, but for all intents and purposes, they got to stick something up your nose if they want to prove that you got Corona or not. Yeah, I see. Victoria Sweeney states, "I hate testing people. <laughs> I feel so bad. It's miserable. It's a miserable test to do because literally you have to." You just have, think of, of someone taking a Q-tip and pushing it so far up your nose that they're scratching your brain. Um, and that's pretty much what it is. Um, and it feels miserable, but it, it's it's necessary in this time. Right. So they, now I have a co-worker. She got tested and she came back, scared me half to death. I'm like, please don't ever let me have to do it. It said it goes up. Now I guess it taps into the brain. It comes down and everything. I'm just like. Yeah, I'm wash my hands and wear my mask and yeah, I mm -mm. <laughs> all right. Um, myth thermal scanners. I see da, 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 da. number four spraying alcohol and chlorine all over your body can kill the new coronavirus. While spraying alcohol and chlorine is a great method to, dis to disinfect surfaces, and even using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer can help keep your hands clean. Using the chemicals all over your body isn't going to kill the virus if you've already been infected. Correct. Spraying such as substances can be harmful to clothes or mucous membranes, your eyes, your mouth. Five, it isn't safe to receive a letter or a package from China. This simply isn't true, according to WHO, World Health Organization. People yeah. receiving packages from China are not at risk of contracting new virus. They explain from previous analysis, we know coronaviruses do not survive long on objects such as letters or packages. Six, Pets can spread the new coronavirus. While pets spread certain forms of coronavirus, the World Health Organization confirms that presently there's no evidence that your domesticated animals can be infected with or spread the new coronavirus. Yeah, that's a big deal. That was a big deal because, I mean, for us, we, um, you know, initially when we got started, uh, we were getting information from, you know, from from our administration telling us, be, be mindful of touching your cats and dogs. I mean... That was the thing. That was that was real. So I was really happy when the World Health Organization came out and said that because we weren't sure. Right. Wow. Myth number seven, pneumonia vaccines can protect you against the new virus. Currently, there is no vaccine to protect you against the, vi the coronavirus, including pneumonia vaccines such as, I'm not going to read them because I can't pronounce any of them. Um, myth number eight, regularly rinsing your nose with saline can help prevent infection with the new coronavirus. Is that like turning yourself upside down with saline? Yeah, it's that neti pot stuff uh, that they uh, spray in their nose and it comes out the other side. All right. um, yeah. Mm. yeah, okay. No, I'm going to pass on that one too. Myth number nine, eating garlic can help prevent infection with the new coronavirus. If you've ever eaten a piece of raw garlic, you know that stuff is pungent. But it won't protect you against illness despite having some antimicrobial microbial properties yeah. 
according to the World Health, Organiz World Health Organization. I can't get that. There is no evidence in the current outbreak that the potent herb will protect you from the coronavirus. Number 10, slathering yourself in, se oh God. Slathering yourself in sesame oil can block the new coronavirus from entering the body. We're not entirely sure where this myth came from, but rubbing, I can't read it. Rubbing sesame oil all over your body definitely won't keep the coronavirus away. Per the World Health Organization, there are some chemical disinfectants that can kill the 2019 in-cove on surfaces, including bleach and chlorine-based disinfectants, ether solvent, 75% ethanol, uh, parasitic acid, and chloroform. However, they have little or no impact on the virus if you put them on the skin or under your nose. In fact, it can be downright dangerous to put those chemicals on your skin. Last one. Number 12, antibiotics. Oh, wait a minute, that past one. Myth number 11, the new coronavirus only affects older people. I heard that a lot yeah. when it first started hitting the airwaves. I heard that it didn't impact black people. Oh, I heard there was so many, um, so many misinformed um, info sessions put out there. The new coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus only affects older people. Unfortunately, people of all ages can be affected by the new coronavirus. However, older people and people with pre-existing medical conditions, as you stated earlier, appear to be more vulnerable to becoming severely ill with the virus. Number 12, antibiotics are effective in preventing and treating the new coronavirus. Keep in mind that antibiotics do not work against viruses of any kind, only bacteria. So because the new coronavirus is an actual virus, antibiotics should not be used as a means of prevention or treatment. In fact, there are no specific medications recommended to treat or prevent the new coronavirus at all. However, those infected with the virus should receive appropriate care to relieve and treat symptoms, and those with severe illness should receive optimized supportive care. Those are the 12 they have listed. So if you want more information, you can Google it. But right now, we have Dr. Lovelace. Yeah. Oh, and the 5G one was great, too. Do y'all remember the 5G networks? Yeah, I heard about the 5G. 5G. Do not and they, yeah, in areas that don't have 5G, but I was like, okay. Makes sense, doesn't make sense. <laughs> that was that was the last one I could do. That was crazy. Let's see. Um, Victoria Sweeney, I, I'm taking Victoria. You work in the healthcare um, industry. Um, she says something about your facial expressions. <laughs> oh, no, no, <laughs> yeah, I can't help them. Man, it is what it is. Like, <laughs> I'll keep it honest I, I with you on this one because uh, sometimes, uh, nah, it's too late to be uh, extra crispy right now. <laughs> Go ahead, Justin. Definitely want to um, touch base because we two about three weeks ago we had an individual that worked in pharmaceutical companies, and um, she wasn't part of one of the two big pharma companies that's kind of joined together to make the coronavirus vaccine. Mm. Um, but through your medical experience and, and your you being a practitioner, we're looking at a rollout of what October, November to get in phase three, and obviously you can explain what that means for for the layman. Um, but do you think that with that, and, and, and this is a, and this is a big question that a lot of people have is, do you think that the vaccine that they're going to be coming up with is something that should be cut, uh, come out? Obviously it's needed. And do you think that, um, the, the, the risk outweighs the reward at this point? Cause that's what a lot of people are nervous about in the general public. Oh, um, if it was up to me, um, I would all, I would obviously tell you the following. Um, I'm. I'm very worried about um, any vaccine that's getting pushed out as fast as it's going. Um, I appreciate the effort that's there. Um, I, I'm just very cautious right now in the speed in which medicines are developed. This was warp speed for all intents and purposes, right? Like this is this is beyond fast. Um, phases are are how we bring medications and therapies that we give people to the market. Um, in this phase that they're currently in, they're trying it on healthy individuals, right? Like they're trying it on the individuals that um, would otherwise have no problems, right? That's where we're at. The next part would be when you actually put it in the community or you put it in real life and then you kind of wait and see what happens. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a part of that scenario where I'm going to wait and see what happens after you put it out into the market. Um, and so I am concerned about this actual vaccine uh, at the moment um, because I have not yet seen enough 
information or data or anything of real significant value that's reassuring me that this is going to be something that's going to be effective enough to prevent this from reoccurring. Um, so if you were in my office today and you asked about getting the, uh, the new COVID-19 vaccine um, that's due out in October or, when, or at some time maybe in the winter, um, I, would, I would really want to ask you first and foremost, did you get your flu shot? Then I, and then if you were at the appropriate age, I'd ask you, hey, did you get your pneumonia shot? Like, I'd want to make sure you got all your other shots first before we venture into that territory at the moment, just because I still would like to wait and see um, how this is actually going to go in more controlled areas um, for a, a larger population of people before I start recommending it on a routine basis like I would the flu shot or the pneumonia shot. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that, you know what I mean, um, because of where we're at as a society, we're very, very, very nervous, you know what I mean, during this new wave that's going to come up. And another question, I know, D, you probably got a thousand oh, good, more questions. Good, I'm um, listening. Um, because I'm on the more, all right, so let's take care of the preconditions, um, the, the, the conditions that might get you to be in ICU, right? And so let's get you into a place and, and stay. And so I'm more on the preventative side, right? right and so right. when I look at it, I look at Corona affecting us 59%, even in what you would call non-urban areas. Because a lot of people are not understanding the reasons sometimes why that may be the case. And you can second that is because we live in urban areas, um, densely populated areas. And obviously when you live in densely populated areas, you're working, your first responders, you, you're you a part of that first wave of people that are helping and assisting, you're going to be obviously overly represented when it comes to the virus. But I do want to want to know how much have you seen of the, the, the younger, non, um, I would say non, people that not, have lower mortality rates, how much have you seen of them getting these strong symptoms when it comes to coronavirus i'm seeing it uh I'm, I'm seeing it i'm seeing it across the board um uh, you know I, I bore witness to it in my own office um and i have you know my staff ranges from you know 30s uh late 60s early 70s um when we're talking about the non-hispanic african americans or we're talking about um non-asians or non-native americans we're talking about the majority uh, of our of our Caucasian population, um, I'm seeing it just the same um, locally within my area, um, and so it impacts them just the same. Um, and a lot of times, it has everything to do with the same principles. What kind of relationship do you actually have with your doctor? How much do you actually care about your health? And what are the healthy things that you normally do on a day to day basis? The same thing applies, and I would agree with you. Um, it kind of goes with preventative care. It kind of goes with how you treat your body consistently. Are you somebody that drinks every night? Are you somebody that dedicates time for their body, their mind, and their spirituality? Are you that person that, that takes time um, to really focus on your mind and spirit? Are you that person that, that is dedicated to your family? Are you that person that sets aside time for prayer or sets aside time for meditation, right? Like all these things matter because all of these things add up to what we're starting to define as social determinants, right? And they all matter. They all make a part of what your health is defined as. And so if you don't have that strong support group in regards to your health and how you go about doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, you're just as risk at risk as anybody else. And, and it's, and for me, it's like, you know, it's like my electrician. It's like, like, it's like, it's like a lot of things that are just going on that you're seeing around you and, 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 and it's impacting everybody. Um, and, and, and the common denominator is just what you say. It's our attention to care for our bodies on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we're ignoring our bodies, when things like this occur, we, we find ourselves at risk. Can you can you go over some of the pre-existing conditions that are going to get you into that, that's, um, that group of people that will have a higher mortality rate? Absolutely. So obesity is one of them, right? It's like obesity is, is the key thing. Um, when you have a body mass index greater than 30, um, and that's, and what that is, it's a measurement or it's a ratio of your height and your weight. Um, if you're a certain height, you, you theoretically should be a certain weight. Um, and, you know, even within our community, I feel like sometimes we have a different body image idea um, of what healthy looks like. 
Um, and I think that kind of plays a role. Um, and then as we get older, we really can't like come back from that because you're just getting older. And so you're left with the notion of being obese. And that plays a huge role. The second thing that plays a huge role is hypertension. How many of us have hypertension or high blood pressure? How many of us are aware that we have hypertension or high blood pressure? How many of us check our blood pressure? What type of foods are we eating on a consistent basis that are gonna increase our risk for developing hypertension? And last but not least, diabetes. Diabetes is, is a very prevalent issue and disease that's affecting our community. And it really has everything to do with what we're eating and how we care for ourselves. Some of it is a predisposition. And so you're, you have a genetic predisposition for having diabetes because it runs in your family. I have diabetics in my family. But overall, the proportion of African-Americans or people of color that, are, that have hypertension, that have obesity, um, that have diabetes, um, those are the things that are putting them at risk for developing complications associated with catching coronavirus. And the primary reason is this, obesity, hypertension, and diabetes all deal with inflammation in some form of fashion. Then you add on a virus that causes massive inflammation in the body. Those are four things that your body is trying to fight all at one time. The body can only do so much. And then if you add age and deconditioning or someone who really doesn't really do much when it comes to physical activity, and if what you consider exercise work or what you do at work is considered exercise. And the last time I checked, there were but so many people that played for the Boston Celtics or the New England Patriots. And so if you're not a professional athlete, you still need to dedicate time for your exercise and taking care of your heart. And so when we're not doing those things, it puts us at risk for having complications associated with COVID-19. Thank you, thank you. I think we had a question, right, Dee? So if you're you curious how long it takes, um, for, for some people, um, you could be exposed you know, within 24 to 48 hours. Um, contracting the virus, it floats in the air immediately. So um, it doesn't take long. You could be in the room for less than two minutes. If somebody is actively coughing or sneezing, you're gonna inhale it and you're gonna just get it and you're not even gonna realize it. And that's what the problem is with this virus. It's that contagious. Wow. Okay, so right now, um, I'm going to flip, go right back to the beginning. Tell people what they need to do to stay safe. I just want to go back. I can come back with other questions, but tell people what they need to do to stay safe one more time. I don't think you can say it enough. So I just want to interrupt the conversation quickly and we go back to step one. How do we stay safe? We stay safe. If we got to go out, you wear a mask, right? Just wear a mask. That's it. At all times, keep your hands away from your face. <laughs> do not touch your eyes. Do not touch your nose. Don't rub your mouth. If you have to, immediately wash your hands. Wash your hands often. Wash your hands until you just, you, it's like second nature to you. Consistently wash your hands. Social distancing. You don't wanna be in crowded places right now. You don't wanna go to a bar. You don't really wanna be in Walmart. You really don't wanna be in the grocery store if you don't have to. You really, really wanna try your best to stay as far away from people as you possibly can on a consistent basis. And you definitely wanna stay away from crowded areas. Last but not least, when you do get home and you're around your loved ones and you are someone that is an essential worker or you're someone who can't afford to work remotely, it's also extremely important to continue those principles of social distancing even in your home as much as you possibly can. Um, I, I'm, I'm well aware that not everybody has the luxury of having multiple rooms in their house. Um, but you still have to create some type of barrier and some type of understanding if you're that essential worker in your family that you do need to set some time aside to really decontaminate. Go ahead and take that shower. Go ahead and wash up. Like, do those things. Leave the shoes at the door. Undress at the door. I know it seems absurd, but we need to take into account the fact that this, con this contagion that is upon us is, is something that walks into your home. It's, it's brought into your home. And if you want to avoid your loved ones from getting sick, those are the things that I want to recommend people to do going forward on a consistent basis. Okay. All right. Justin, anything else? No, I'm just going to comment that he, he did, did something that a lot of, not many doctors do is really come to a conclusion that these pre-existing conditions are obviously a big problem with the preventative measures to make sure you don't have these Pre-existing conditions, which are all lifestyle changes, 
are important. I think that that's one thing our community really has to understand. Like I said, I'm a preventive measure. I don't want them to go. I always say it's prevention, primary care, and the emergency room. If you don't do all three or do one of two, you're going to end up in the emergency room at some point dealing with a chronic illness. And so um, I just... I'm glad that you did bring to the table that um, it is very important to take those preventive measures. And you said something that other doctors don't do. You know what I mean? And your brother, you said, hey, brother. health, mindfulness, this is things that matters. About, and, and it's so important to general health. But yeah, go on. It's coming. It's coming. It has to. We have to talk more about this, right? Like, you know, I could lie to you and, and tell you that I have all the medicines for you, right? Because I'm just going to give you medicine so I can keep feeding my kids. But that's not how this works. And the unfortunate part to all of this is that preventative care medicine really doesn't generate any revenue. That's the that's the real honest answer, if you really want to be honest about it. But it really makes the most difference in most people's lives. And we have to continue to talk about it. And we have to continue to advocate for it. We have to make sure that it is there for us. We need to make sure that our parks are there. We need to make sure that we are, we are, we're advocating for bike paths. We need to make sure that we're advocating for safe sidewalks and safe streets to walk on. Like, we need to continue to advocate for those things. We need to continue to advocate for fresh food in our areas, for farmers markets. We need to be we need to want those things in our areas because those are the things that are making the difference. And when we continue to talk about preventative care, it's it's just as much as taking care of your body is also making sure that you have a healthy community. And so if you have a community where you don't have good access to fruits and vegetables, or you live in what some people are calling food deserts, what we had talked about in one of our previous meetings, those things matter to people's health. And we have to want those. We need to demand those because we deserve those and we need those in order to be a very viable community, period. So Springfield, there are a lot of people um, for the folks who may tune in at different points during the week. We run this all throughout the week, probably all clear through to next Wednesday. People are complaining because the Parks Department in the city of Springfield won't put the hoops back up on the basketball courts. Can you talk about why that would not be a good idea. I understand people want yeah. exercise. <laughs> Can you talk about why that would not be oh, a good idea? That would not be a good idea for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, you're passing the ball around, brother. Like, you can't, the problem, the, the couple of problems are this. The close contact associated with playing basketball, and I love basketball like the next man. You can't be that close on top of each other if you're actually playing a serious game of basketball. And there's no way you can actually play basketball and have six feet of separation and play a real game of any sort. So why even put it out there for the opportunity for people to put themselves in that position in which they would just be super spreaders at that particular standpoint? Because, you know, if there's a good basketball game going, I got next and I'm going to be there. Right. Like, And then, yeah. and then I'm going to call my homie. He's got next. And then next thing you know, there's like 30 of us out here. and We are here playing ball, talking loud. Next thing you know. Oh, guess what? I got to go back home. Oh, all right. I'm going back home. Ain't nobody thinking about showering or decontaminating. Nobody's going back to a bubble like they had, you know, in Orlando. So those are the real issues when we're talking about creating environments where you could have a super spreader, right? Like, and those are the ones of them where number one, we're on top of each other, yelling and screaming. Number two, we are all touching the same object in some form or fashion. It just creates an environment that will just lead to more spread of this disease. So you mean like somebody getting their sweat and everything all over me and breathing on me while they cover me with the elbow? That's that's not healthy. Yeah, man, that's me giving you that elbow. And that's me breathing on you <laughs> and telling you I'm about to dunk on you, right? Like <laughs> and, yeah. and sure enough, and sure enough, and sure enough, we I have given you COVID in that way, right? Like that's exactly how I went down. Uh, because you right. don't know where that you may not know where that brother works, right? Like you know where I work. I'm telling you straightforward. Yeah, I work in the hospital and I've been exposed. Like, you know what I'm saying? It could happen just like that. And the next thing you know, you bring that home to your wife and kids, God forbid, and here we are, right? We, we create that scenario. So, yeah, uh, you want to avoid these elbows for, for, for this season. I'll catch you uh, next spring. <laughs> for real. If this is over, if this if is not, over, yes. if I'll see you in 2023 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm shooting. Yeah, I'm shooting for 2022. So, yeah, I retired the jersey and everything, so it's fine. I, I go for my old man walks now. Like my jersey been done retired. I'm scared. I might pull an Achilles or something, and you know those man. old man injuries I be getting these days. So, bruh, I, just I think go I got all y'all. 
I, I could walk down the street and twist my ankle on a small rock. You never know, got injured ever. Stop saying what? that. Don't play sports. Oh, don't I don't play, sport. play sports, man. <laughs> Dude, what I'm talking about, man. Just, <laughs> a lot of people have said that. Then they'd be on the receiving end of what I can do. And it's just like, I tried to, I tried to told you. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. Just res, regular health care. How okay. often should people get checkups? Like, um, like, why would I? How often should people get regular checkups? Which they just, I mean, even if you don't think you're sick, people should get checked out on a regular basis, correct? And see their doctor periodically. How does that work? Yeah, so let's let's talk about that. I think that's great. So, okay. so as, as a doctor does primary care, that's that's right up my alley, right? So, it's dependent upon a couple of things, though, right? It depends on your age. Okay. In your twenties, 20, 22, 24, 25. I'm just checking to make sure you're safe. You're not drinking too hard. You're not smoking too much. Um, you're keeping it safe with your sexual practices, things of that nature, right? By the time you get to your 30s and your 40s, you kind of want to check in. Hey, doc, what's up? I'm good. You want to have that relationship, right? Like having a primary care provider is about a relationship. You don't necessarily have to check in every year unless you have a medical condition. But traditionally, by the time you get to 35, if you're a male, you know, you technically want to start checking in with your doctor, especially if you're an African-American and a high risk of prostate cancer, you definitely want to come talk to me, right? But more importantly, we need to start talking about blood pressure, right? How's your blood pressure doing? How's your weight? You know, you might've gained a couple pounds, right? Like every now and then you just need somebody to hold you accountable. And so in your thirties and forties, you want to start establishing your network of healthcare providers, right? Like your dentist, your chiropractor, if you have one, your massage therapist, right? Like they all matter um, when it comes to creating your, your preventative health, you know, physician, right? Like all of those things start to play a role in how you're developing your health group for you, right? Because that's what we're starting to wanting to develop. And you should be doing that in your 30s and your 40s. Right. By the time you get to your 50s, though, you need to see me about every year, right? Because in your 50s, we need to start talking about the things that you're at risk for, right? So we need to start talking about colon cancer screenings. Uh, right. We need to start talking about can uh, lung cancer issues, breast cancer issues, cervical cancer issues. But a lot of times, especially for our women, they typically have had a relationship with their doctor earlier on in life just because of either birthing issues or just it's more traditional for women to seek health care a lot sooner than men early in their life. And a lot of times, if anything, it, it, it at the latest it starts if once they start having children. Um, but for men, sometimes it's very odd and you can't really figure out when it is. But typically what I would say, you know, every two to three years in between your 20s and 30s, you want to check in. By the time you get to your 40s, into your 50s, probably every year, every other year, you want to have a conversation. You want to check out, see what's going on. Start establishing your health care group that you have, whatever that may be, because everybody has one, whether you want to admit it or not. And then by the time you get to your 50s, it's just about every year. And then once you turn 65... I mean, listen, we might get together every three to six months, depending upon what's cracking. Like, you got your sugar, you got your blood pressure. I mean, Everything. things just start to develop, right? Like, and that's just part of aging, right? And so how we all age, right? Like, so, you know, you, you turn 21 this year, then you're 22 the next year, right? Like, we, we understand it chronologically, but sometimes we don't all age at the same pace. You know, you look at somebody, you'd be like, man, life really treated them hard because they look rough. And then other people, you'd be like, man, Life has not done anything to you, right? And so what they're saying is, or what people are seeing is just how your experiences in life and how your health has has really impacted you overall starts to kind of age you. And so we need to continue to watch and monitor that, whatever may come about. And so that would be my recommendation for how we would become established or what my recommendations would be for establishing yourself with the, with the primary care provider because everybody needs one. Right. And... Since everybody needs one, you guys are probably overflowed, but I'm going to throw your information out there. Oh, it's I'll already it up there. there. Family Thank Medicine you. Associates, 75 Springfield Road. Um, I don't know what the STE stands for. I'll be sweet. honest. Sweet. 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 sweet one. Westfield Mass, 01085. You can give them a call at 413-562-5173. So, again, Family Medicine Associates, it's only right there. In Westfield, if you're looking for a good doctor, um, yeah, I know one. You know one? Yeah, I think I know one. 
Yeah, but I typically have cultural issues with doctors. Sometimes they just don't understand the cultural context from which I'm trying to articulate. And that's very true. And that's actually important. And there's not enough evidence that really, well, there's a lot of evidence growing that actually supports that, by the way, right? Like okay. that makes a huge impact, right? Um, we need more women doctors. We need more doctors of color. We need to continue to encourage that. Because there's a direct co correlation and relationship between Absolutely. the health that those, that that community gets um, if they trust their healthcare provider or even feel like their healthcare provider um, is is woven within their community, right? Like that's that's not like that's a real thing. And so I want to encourage all my all my young people out there that have any inclination of wanting to go into healthcare. You're needed right now, and you're needed to come take care of our people because we need you the most. And yeah. Nobody else is coming but you. And so you need to just own up to that responsibility. If you love those people in your town, if you love those people within your neighborhood, the best thing you could do is continue to pursue a career in healthcare. And I'm going to continue to champion that and continue to encouraging that every step of the way as I, as I get through all of this as well. All right. Well, I'm going to say this. We run a program called the Young Scholars Academy every Saturday at the Boys and Girls Club Family Center. You won't even have to leave your house because of COVID. Now you can do it virtually. We'd love to have you talk to our young kids. I mean, our, our, little ones, our super wonders. I'm and I'll talk with them about what you do and why they should consider that as they begin, you know, as they reach that age where they start considering careers. And I want to say again, we are on with Dr. Akinyale. I mess it up again? No, you got it, brother. You got, it, brother. I got the whole thing out there. You got the I whole thing right there. there. It's right there for you. Lovely. His practice, focus, his practice focus specializes in the prevention and treatment of disease in adults, promotes education to enable patients to make informed decisions. Correct. And that's just so, I mean, I just went through all that with my mom, may she rest in peace, um, back early summer. And it's like, we ran into problems with, you know, some of the physicians that she was dealing with in terms of helping her to make the most informed and most educated decisions. Yeah. Um, they looked at her age, they looked at her race, and we ended up calling, it's so crazy because we ended up calling Justin on the phone like once, twice, three times a week. Okay, what is he saying? What are we? What should we do? How should we, well, and he'll be like, yo, keep me on, on um, intercom so I can listen. Mm -hmm. So I think it's critical when you talk about the cultural relevancy in medicine yeah. in terms of uh, medical care, you know, med the service delivery. It's critical. So I'm strongly, encur strongly encouraging people. Hit up Dr. Lovelace, again, Please. Family Medical Associates. 75 Springfield Road, Suite 1, Westfield, Mass, 413-562-5173. After today, I'm going to tell you there's no excuses. You can't say that you can't find a doctor of color. More specifically, for someone in my shoes, a black man with a medical degree. Hey, brother, it matters. <laughs> just, it matters. It I'm just matters. saying, we all, man. Need one. we all need one. We so, all need yeah. one, man. So we are at the one-hour mark. If you guys like to sum this conversation, if you want to just sum up any closing thoughts, basically, just anything you want to tell folks in our community, things you think they need to hear in terms of a closing thought. Um, I think that um, from a positive perspective, I would tell you that in Western Massachusetts specifically, although the rates of coronavirus or COVID-19 are going up, I think the positive out of all of this is that we're not seeing our people in the ICU. I think that's a good sign. Right. I would say going forward, what we've learned from all of this is that we are people that, that have endured oppression um, and systemic racism and that the disparities in health that we're seeing now are just another example of that. And in this time in which there is an election and a time in which we need to hold our elected officials accountable, now is the time to continue to get out there and making sure your vote is cast. Because all the things that are affecting us right now as a people and as a community have a direct correlation between those who are at those seats of power that have made laws that have been either just or unjust for us. And we are now dealing with those repercussions. And so in closing, this is another example of how systemic racism has affected our health. And it is up to us to make a difference, to get out there and to make sure that our presence is felt and our voices are heard. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Lovelace. We are so happy you joined us. Um, Proud to be here. You know, we'll probably be calling you again at some point. <laughs> hey, man, this made my day. You have no idea. I've been, I've been listening. I've been dying to get out of here and talk, man. So I, I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys in the fellowship. 
and be able to talk about my story and talk about you know my plight and trying to make things right. So I'm just really appreciative to be here tonight. Thank you. Justin, any closing thoughts? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. You mean just love yourselves and, and get a, a primary care that's black. I'm not going to say color because <laughs> you're black. So um, <laughs> you go, I'm going to probably be calling you um, soon enough. Um, and, and definitely we're going to be talking. We're going to be talking about really getting our people into healthcare. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's more important that people understand when it comes down to it, because it's one thing to know a black person's body, but it's one thing to know their whole history and understand yeah. why they might eat this or what. And so it's important. So just get in there. If you guys are interested in healthcare, get, get into the healthcare field, nurses, PAs. PAs are huge right now. Tell them doc, but we won't even get into that, but go to PA school, be a doctor, do a- Listen, yeah, we can talk about it. Whenever you ready, I'm ready to talk about PAs, bro. <laughs> For sure. It's critical. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And again, this is Black Health. Let's talk about it. Because if we don't talk about it, nobody will. We'll always have people talking at us and not to us. So let's do that ourselves. We have all the professionals that we need to get us the information that needs to hit these streets. Let's spread this like we spread bad rumors. Let's get this information out here, y'all. Our Black Health is all we got. This is Black Health. We out of here. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>